Hi everyone, this is going to be a short video. I just wanted to share something that I think is really neat. It's a common adage online that you should never read the comments. And I want to talk about how happy I am that the comments on a particular blog post on my blog have been so completely awesome. What they're related to is the CM5 LED panels. Uh, these were surplused from a CM5 machine that we disassembled at work maybe four years ago. They're pretty iconic. So here they are in the background in Jurassic Park. And so I just built a simple wooden frame. I mounted them up. Um, I had a X10 power module, which I got rid of because it kept false triggering. Uh, anyway, if you want more details about you know this part of the build, then you should just look at the blog. Uh, so it it got some really neat attention uh, to begin with. Uh, somebody from Thinking Machines found it and left some comments about about the process, about the machine, um, all that kind of stuff. Some people were really interested in making their own replicas, so they wanted detail on the silk screen and, and the masking, so there's black paint masking out the tops and the bottoms of the LEDs there. Uh, when I was at work cleaning out a lab, I found a bunch of VHS tapes, so I digitized the VHS tapes of our machine being installed. Somebody else was interested in... Um, it's hard to see, but on these side panels in the video, you can see it. You can see LEDs to these side panels here, and some of those are hard drive LEDs, and some of them are processor LEDs. So you can see, actually, the hard drive LEDs I think are on this side, and the processor LEDs are on the other side of the machine. And um, these are uh, on the edge of the processor modules. You can see these 90 degree LEDs. Uh, so. Anyways, I, I encourage you to read the comments. They're, they're really great and really um, constructive. But more recently, within the last... Um, oh, that's really interesting. So I didn't notice until now that um, Iskunk, I think is how you'd pronounce his name or her name, got interested in this um, quite a while ago, over two years ago. Well, no, almost two years ago, and has been participating on it for a while, as well as Mark. Um, and so these two, Iskunk and Mark, have been communicating back and forth quite a bit um, on the blog about how to replicate the design of the LEDs. And then Jim who um, doesn't want to share his, his last name, actually wrote the firmware that ran on the, I think he said they were Intel chips. They are the microcontrollers on the LEDs themselves, and they use JTAG to clock the data. Um, these 74 BCT 8244s are uh, shift registers with JTAG. And so um, he talks about the different modes. Random and pleasing seven is what pretty much everybody likes or is mo most interested in. And um, yeah, I think this is, I, you know, I comment that I think that's a really great post. And so this just set Mark and Icegunk off on the most excellent collaborative effort to try to replicate the exact pattern of the LEDs. And so it's been fun to get these emails in my inbox, you know, every other day or so, or sometimes several times a day. And um, they spent a lot of time investigating two seconds of video from, a, I think, a Richard Feynman documentary. I don't remember um, what the documentary was about, but it shows a couple of seconds Oh, the video, and I thought, well, it's silly that they have to obsess about a couple of seconds of of this video, considering you know I have an LED board, I can just run it and show them the boot up proceed, how you know what it looks like when it starts, and um, and the whole process. But I thought, why not take it a step further? Because see, he 
um, Iskunk hand transcribed the image of the LEDs when um, he said when uh, from my blog when I said that it was all finished. So he transcribed them into binary, he made them into hex, and then used that to validate his implementation of Jim's code. And um, but what he really wanted to do was because because the random code rolls over, he doesn't know what the seed is. So because every pattern will be shown eventually. Um, he really wants to know what the seed is so he can get the start because this can be any moment in time. If he chose zero, I think he says later that if he chose zero as the seed, um, it would have been 22 hours from turning on that, that that pattern, exact pattern would have come up. So um, I recorded the video and I posted it online and um, I'll cut some of that in if I haven't already. And they discovered that Jim had used zero uh, x zero b a d for the seed, which is you know one of those clever Easter egg type jokes. So, anyways, like I said, I took it a little step further, and I was you know been playing with Swift a lot in the last couple of years, and specifically in the last couple of months when I've been working on the Swift ARM port. So I thought, why not write? a little computer vision project using Swift see if I can't automatically transcribe that video so that's what I did so by now you've seen the video I tried to make it you know kind of square to the camera the carpets kind of in the way of the bottom but you know what are you gonna do so I learned a bit about uh, AV assets which is a part of AV foundation just created a little class that manages the assets. Um, so you know you can give it a URL, and in this case, if you download this code off GitHub, the URL is already set to be the small version of the movie um, downloaded from my blog. It makes an AV asset. It um, makes an AV asset image generator, which is a, a class in AV Foundation that you can use to get images out of a movie. And then um, it does a little bit of work to get the timestamps for every frame in the video. And um, there's a couple of little gotchas. So, for instance, if you don't set requested time to tolerance or requested time tolerance after and before to some number smaller than the interval between the frames then um, AV Asset Image Generator won't give you your individual frames, even if you ask for timestamps of individual frames. In my case, I didn't set these at all, and I was only getting keyframes. So I would get 15 keyframes that were you know plus and minus that keyframe, and then it would go to the next keyframe. And that was a headache. Um, okay, so the rest of this just generates a list of timestamps. And then I have a function to give me a single frame, which is useful when I the application starts up and I want that first frame to um, set the locations of the LEDs. And then um, there's a process frames function that runs the uh, async images. So basically this function, once you start it, it will call um, this block for every frame and you just give it a... Uh, you give it, where is it? Uh, yeah, you give it frames. Sorry, you give it this array of CM times, and then it will tell you what the time you requested is, what the actual time was. Um, it'll give you an image that's an optional in case it wasn't able to find anything for that time. And it'll, it gives you some error and status codes. So anyways, that's how I get frames. And then um, I have a little grid class that handles the corners of the grid of LEDs. And these I just coded in so I didn't have to drag the points all the time. Uh, once the corners are set, then it is able to make an array of points. And these are cached. Um, so whenever the corners are changed, it invalidates this cache so I don't have to do this math every single time. Uh, the same thing with getting rectangles from each of these points. Um, what I do there is both for the circles 
in the grid that you'll see in a second and um, for the computation of the values in, for the LEDs I want to have uh, NS rect to sample them. Okay and then I've got a little view class that will show me the image and it will show me the grid and it has um, some interaction so I can move the grid point, the grid corners to fine tune and tweak the grid to make sure that it's it's just right and um, eventually I'd, I hope to get rid of these uh, 480 by 640 constants and let you load in whatever image you or whatever video you want to play around if you'd like um, but the version on GitHub still has, at this moment, still has those a few of those constants left. Okay, and then there's a sampler class that um, you set an image and um, it uses a computed property to um, set the image, but when it does that, it also creates a CG bitmap, con CG bitmap context uh, around that image so we can actually get the bits in there and then um, I have a few functions to make getting a sample a single sample out of the image at a given point and it does just a little bit of validation and it has to flip the coordinates um, because the bitmap coordinates are zero zeros in the top left and um, in views and NS views and most other places on the Mac the uh, origin is zero zero is on the bottom left so it just has to flip um, image height minus the point will flip that so that the coordinate spaces are the same and then if I want to get a sample I can give it a rectangle and then I just have an accumulator I get <clears throat> um, a point for each of the pixels in that rect and then I divide to get the average and I make a color and return that and then I also have one um, additional sort of convenience routine that you can give it a grid, um, an instance of this grid class, and it will return an array of all the points in it. And that obviously just makes things a little bit, a little bit simpler. So last thing um, I want to show you is the app delegate, and here's really where all the logic is. It's not super clean, but. Um, I have a function that will take an NS color and it will convert it to a row. So the, the LEDs are 16 wide, right? So it takes a array, an array of colors and it will turn that into a, a uint 16 for that array of LEDs, if that makes sense. It's like a bit mask, basically. It's just an array of bits. Um, and it also does the thresholding. So in this case, the red channel is completely swamped out, and the green component of almost all systems has more um, bits than uh, any of the other color channels, so I use the green component. And then this threshold is found empirically uh, using a histogram, which I'll, I'll show an image of that. So there's the histogram of the green component, and uh, this one's really nice because we have two very clear um, states with not a lot of ambigu ambiguous um, readings in between. So I selected 110 as the cutoff point to hopefully capture as much of the difference between them as possible. Okay, so I go through all the colors. I um, set them on the rightmost bit and then I bit shift them over as I accumulate them and then I return. Uh, this collapse samples function will um, t address the fact that there are multiple frames per every step of the animation on the LEDs. So this uses a hysteresis so uh, it takes sometimes two or three frames for the 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 uh, LED panel to update. So this way I wait for those frames to finish and they have a high difference between frames so this just gives me the number of bits in the entire frame that have changed. <clears throat> and so uh, once it's, when it's unstable is when it's in that transition 
And then, so if it's unstable and we have a difference of zero, so we have two frames that are identical, then uh, we know that the animation is transitioned to the next frame on the LEDs, and then we take that sample. And then once that sample has been taken, um, we don't sample anymore until we get a difference greater than 10. And because occasionally in that sort of off time, the time where it's static, we do get small bit shifts, like one is really common to have one bit change. Um, sometimes there's like a nine bit change, and I'm not sure why that is. You know, this is real world video stuff, so things are fuzzy. Um, so the launching just starts all the classes up and makes the links, a histogram, a timeline, and an animation. And then when I do the run, it does that um, asynchronous process. And it needs to be locked, otherwise uh, we get um, contention and uh, it doesn't work. So uh, the save function just prints out whatever um, quantity is not commented out. In this case, it's the timeline or the animation. But I also, this will print out a few samples so that I can see a timeline and get an idea of the spread of values. And then the histogram will help me identify the spread of values a little bit more too. Okay, so let's run the program. And I'm going to bring the console up and kind of make that a little bigger so you can see the output. Okay, so here's the program and you can see there's these circles and so we can move these circles around um, if the grid was you know if it was like lying on its side or whatever but um, in this case I've done a bit of work in Final Cut to clean up the video and make it a little more square and also I wanted to share this online obviously so I wanted these to be really small image file or movie files so I made it 480 by 640 and other stuff Okay, so that's that, and so now I can do file run, or I can just hit command R, and it will um, run the video. At the same time in the background, it's it's thresholding within uh, the recs that are contained within these circles. And I think I'm using a 10 pixel or 10 point rect um, centered within these circles. So, you know, that's fun, whatever, but I'm going to go ahead and just hit Command S to save it. And that cancels the um, collection of the frames. And so you can see in the console output I have, you know, frame one was the last from step zero, and it will show the 16 bit ma um, maps for each row, each of the 32 rows. And um, you'll notice that each of these are. Uh, about six frames apart and that's because each uh, step in the animation is 200 milliseconds and we're doing 30 frames a second so if you work that out that ends up being um, six frames per step in the animation and that works out just a bit about perfectly and I wanted to avoid uh, assuming that and just skipping ahead because I know that clock drifts can happen so I really wanted the hysteresis function to get that right and then the timeline tells a very similar, if not identical, story. And it has four different lights that I selected to be sort of in opposite corners. Well, there's the top left corner, the bottom right corner, and two in the middle. And this, the orange one is the bottom right channel. And let's see if I can select it. Okay, so you can see it's in the center and it is up against the carpet and the carpet leaks a lot of light and is bright on its own so this is by far the hardest channel to get right and I'm certain that I've got quantities wrong in it. Alright well I think that's it. Uh, thank you very much for listening as long as you did. I hope it was as interesting for you as it was for me. If you're curious about how any of the code works uh, feel free to grab, grab it on GitHub and try it out. Uh, it's Mac only Swift because AV Foundation, as far as I know, I'm pretty sure, doesn't exist on Linux Swift yet, but maybe one day it will. Thanks for watching.